I just wanted to start by acknowledging as well that we're on the, um, the lands of the Kulin Nation and acknowledge particularly that the Indigenous population of, of Australia are impacted a lot by kidney disease and we all need to work to try and support that and um, improve kidney health outcomes for all of, um, all of Australia. I'd also like to say that I don't have any conflicts of interest, I don't have any um, financial arrangements with any companies to, to declare at all. So today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about tuberous sclerosis and the kidneys. Now there's different people in the room um, and your levels of knowledge might be quite different. So some of this you may know already, some of it may be new information, but if there's anything you want to ask along the way, please just put your hand up and we can um, discuss it and hopefully have a bit of a conversation so we can all learn a bit more about how tuberous sclerosis affects the kidneys. So this is what I'm going to talk about this morning. First of all, I just wanted to give a little bit of a background on what is tuberous sclerosis, and you, many of you may know some of that, but just to set the scene, and then talk about how it can affect your kidneys. I want to have a little bit of a chat about what treatments are available for, for your kidneys, and then step away from tuberous sclerosis just to talk about kidney health and things that you can do generally to keep your kidneys healthy, independent of how tuberous sclerosis is affecting them. At the end, I'll touch briefly on some of the other parts of your body that are affected by tuberous sclerosis, but we probably won't go into that in a lot, de lot of detail today. And Helen, this afternoon, will talk a lot more about the lungs uh, and how tuberous sclerosis can affect the lungs. So first of all, what is tuberous sclerosis? Well, we all know, um, hopefully, that genes are the instructions that help make our cells in our body. So we can think of our genes as being um, encased in a book, and the genes are the instructions that tell our body how to make different cells in our body. And if we think of genes as being a sentence, sometimes there can be an error in that sentence which mixes up the instruction, and therefore the part of the body that you're trying to make may have an error in the instruction on how it's made. With tuberous sclerosis, there are two spelling mistakes that, uh, two genes that can have spelling mistakes in them that can cause the problem. These genes are called TSC1, and that encodes a protein uh, called harmatin, and TSC2, which encodes a protein called tuberin. And these proteins are important in how your body functions. So if there's an error in the spelling of, of these genes, the protein isn't made properly and might not function. What do these proteins do in our body? Well, the proteins affect something called mTOR or mTORC. You may have heard of this because of the medications associated with it. And this um, in our body normally helps, mTOR helps our cells grow properly. So when conditions are good, when there's lots of oxygen and sugar and things around in the body, the mTOR um, helps our cells grow and helps them to grow into um, the tissues that we need to function. Tuberous sclerosis um, complex, which is made up by these genes, works when the conditions aren't good, when there isn't enough oxygen or enough sugar for our cells, it blocks that mTOR so that our cells don't grow too much, so that we're not overgrowing cells when there isn't enough to feed, feed them. And what happens for people who don't have tuberous sclerosis gene is that you can get uncontrolled growth of those cells. So the cells continue to grow and don't have the signals that tell them to stop growing, and that means that they can grow into tumours or masses that um, are not part of the normal function of our body and don't get the signal to switch them off and tell them to stop growing. Now, our genes all have two sides. So we inherit half of our genes from our mother and half of our genes from our father. And tuberous sclerosis normally affects one side of those genes. But in order to have a problem in your cell, you need to have a problem in the other side too. And what happens is you get a spontaneous change in the other side and those two combined will cause the effect which makes the tumours grow. Which is why this problem doesn't affect all the cells in our body. It only affects the areas that have the second half of our gene affected and therefore will cause the cells to grow. Now, the end result of this is that we can get tumours um, growing in different parts of the body and they can cause different symptoms. So those tumours can grow in the brain and for some people they cause um, things such as epilepsy or um, autism or intellectual impairment or developmental issues. Those tumours can also grow in the heart and cause problems with how the heart functions. 
in the kidneys, which we'll go into more detail, in the lung, which we'll talk about later, or on the skin. So we can grow, and in other parts of the body as well. These tumours can grow in different parts of the body. And this picture here just shows us, it talks about different parts of the body. And on the, um, the up and down, it shows the percentage of people with tuberous sclerosis that are affected by these different problems. And on the, the sideways axis is people as they grow older over time. And what this shows is that the different parts of tuberous sclerosis affect you at different stages of your life. So if you look at the blue line that's showing problems with the heart, you see that most people with tuberous sclerosis may have a problem with their heart when they're very young. But as they grow older, that becomes less common. Whereas other things such as the kidneys, which are shown with the green line, don't affect very young children very much. But as people develop and grow into adults, they become more common. And therefore, adults with tuberous sclerosis are more affected by the kidney issues. So at different stages of your life living with tuberous sclerosis, different aspects of the condition may affect you. Um, and that's why adults with tuberous sclerosis, such as yourself, may have different problems from children um, who are affected by the condition. So that's probably all the most technical part of my talk to try and set some background. And it may have been a bit too technical for some, or may have been something you know. But I just wanted to pause there and see if anyone had any questions on that that they wanted to ask at this point, or whether we move on to talking a bit more about the kidneys. Helen. Um, in families with tuberous sclerosis, is it 50% who are affected? So yes, it's the, the inheritance of tuberous sclerosis is what we call autosomal dominant, and that means that you only need one copy of the gene that has the spelling mistake in order to have the condition. So because we each inherit two copies, a copy of each gene, and you only need one to be affected, that means that having a child, there's a 50% chance, or one in two chance, that that gene gets passed on to the next generation. That being said, most people who have tubular sclerosis don't have parents who had tubular sclerosis. They're the first person in their family to have the gene. And that's because the, the gene change can happen spontaneously. So you might be the first person in your, in your family but if you were to have uh, children, the chances of passing that on to the next generation would be one in two. That being said, we have lots of options for people who want to have children um, and to plan to have their family, where we can use various technologies and techniques to help you have your family if you want to make sure you're not passing on that gene to the next generation. So there are options if that's something that uh, you're looking at in your future of, of having children. And there are things that can help to, to make sure that chance is zero of passing the gene on. Okay, we might move on from talking in the broad sense um, to some of the, the specifics about your kidneys and how tubular sclerosis might affect your kidneys. So there are three, and tubular sclerosis, as many of you know, is a condition that has lots of long words in it. So um, some of this today will just be trying to break those down and explain what all these long words are. So one of the ways that the um, tuberous sclerosis can affect your kidneys is what we call angiomyolipomas, and we'll go into these in a bit more detail. It can also uh, cause cysts on your kidneys, and in some cases it can cause kidney cancers, and we'll go into each of these things in a bit more detail. So what is an angiomyolipoma? Well, we said that tuberous sclerosis causes tumours, and a tumour is a, a growth of tissue. Now, when we think about tumour, sometimes we think about cancer. And what cancer means is that that tumour can spread to other places um, and can be quite dangerous to your health. Most of the tumours that grow in tuberous sclerosis are benign, which means they're uh, not going to spread to other places. So angiomyolipomas, if we break that word down, means that the tumours grow from different cells in our body. So angio refers to blood vessels. Some of you might have heard, for example, of an angiogram, where you have a look at the blood vessels around your heart. Myo relates to muscles, and lipo relates to fat, like liposuction, for example. So these are tumors, and oma just means a tumor. So these are tumors that are made up of some blood vessels, some muscle cells, and some fat cells that form together to make a, a mass in the kidneys. They can grow as a single tumour, and these are just some pictures, some cartoons um, of places where a large single angiomyolipoma can grow. So they may grow outside the kidney, so this, this is a picture of your kidneys. And just to take a step back, your kidneys are an organ, you have two of them that sit uh, at the back. 
They function to produce urine, and the function of your kidneys has multiple issues, which we'll get into later, but it helps to get rid of waste products from your body and to balance the fluid and salt in your body. So these are a picture of your kidneys that normally filter your blood and make urine. You can see that on um, the left here, you've got a tumor that's growing outside the kidney, and on the right, you've got one growing inside the kidney. You can see that from this picture, they're made up of the red blood vessels and pink fat, a pink muscle and the yellow fat that combine to form the tumor. Now in some people, this is a scan, a CT scan, they might not just have one, they may have many uh, angiomyolipomas that grow within the kidneys. So you can see that there are lots of those black dots throughout the kidneys, indicating there are multiple of these tumors growing at the same time. Now these graphs show how people, how angiomyolipomas change over time. Similar to the last one, um, age is along the sideways axis there. And the first graph A shows uh, in an average population the size of AML. So we see that if you follow the blue line, as people get older, the size of the angiomyolipomas or AMLs gets bigger over time. But in the B graph, you can also see that people get more angiolipomas if you look at a population over time. So as people grow older, the tumors get bigger and um, it's more likely that you'll have more than one or multiple tumors over time. Now, some facts about angiomyolipomas. They're very common in adults who have tubular sclerosis, and studies show that they occur in over 80% of people. Some studies have even shown up to 100% if you look very, very carefully for them. So it's very likely that adults living with tubular sclerosis will develop at least an AML at some point in their life. Why do we worry about these um, tumors? So if they're benign and they don't spread anywhere, why do they cause any problem? The main concern we have of them is because they're made of blood vessels and those blood vessels can grow large, they're at risk of having a bleed uh, into the, inside them. And if there's a bleed inside your kidney, it's not something that we can put a hand on and easily stop and that can be quite a significant event for someone. So we're concerned about them primarily because of the risk of what we call spontaneous bleeding or bleeding without an accident or trauma, so a sudden bleeding. And that can be a medical emergency where you need to go to a hospital and have it treated straight away. Now the risk of that bleeding changes with how big the tumour is growing, how quickly it's growing, and the characteristics of those blood vessels if there are lots of um, sort of balloons or, or dilations in the blood vessels. So the risk over time, uh, we need to monitor these things to, to see how uh, likely it is that the tumours may bleed. Yeah? Yeah. What would be the symptoms if there was to be a bleed? So if, if someone had a sudden bleed from it, it can cause sudden pain or blood in the urine. So you may, the blood may go through and come out through the urine. Or if the bleeding goes inside but not through the urine, people might suddenly feel dizzy, lightheaded or pass out from blood loss. So if there's a pain and a sudden dizziness in particular, or um, then that's a, a reason for someone who knows they have AMLs to present to an emergency department for emergency treatment, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so yeah, mainly pain, bleeding in the urine, dizziness, or feeling like your heart's really racing. Is there any other symptoms for somebody who's non-verbal? Um, like Jeffrey wouldn't be able to tell us that he's dizzy. So, um, so you might see things like someone might become very pale because their blood pressure drops low or they're, or they're bleeding internally. So if they became very pale and clammy, like they were looking like they might faint, that might be a sign of a bleed inside. The, the goal of treatment of um, angiomyolipomas is to prevent this. And this is why it's important that we follow up people's kidneys and we treat them, because we want to prevent these uh, episodes of bleeding and keep people safe. So that's why we look and we screen and we follow and we treat to prevent the bleeding. But yes, in someone who's nonverbal, they might look like they're about to faint or like they have a sudden pain uh, inside their abdomen. Yeah. You mentioned before about an accident, so you mean like a fall? So, so I'm saying that, that they can bleed without an accident. So because they're inside, so normally if we have a bleed from the kidney, it's because someone's been in a car accident or had some sort of major trauma, whereas uh, AMLs can bleed without a major trauma. So it can be just a spontaneous thing that occurs. Yeah. Just that Olivia skates. Mm -hmm. She's a skater, so we're always worried about that. 
Yeah, so, so it's important to do everything we can to reduce the risk of bleeding, but with people who have small AMLs or treated AMLs, they're very much able to do normal activities. Um, it's about preventing that rapid growth or growth over time to prevent the risk of bleeding. With tuberous in the kidney, once they scrape it out and remove it, can it redevelop again? Yes, so we'll come to the treatments in a second, and one of them may be a surgery to remove a, a tumour. That particular tumour is unlikely to come back if they fully remove it, but like I showed in the picture before, people can have multiple tumours, so you may get a different tumour that grows over time. So even if you've had one completely removed, it still needs to be followed up so that if a different one occurs, then that can be treated as well. No, great. Thank you very much for all the questions. It, it makes it much nicer to talk rather than just um, be delivering from slides. Can I just go back into time? You mentioned before about TS1, TS2. Mm -hmm. So is there any differences between those? Um, are there big differences? Not in to the point where we would have differences in uh, the monitoring and the, that we would recommend. So the, the monitoring would be based on the overall diagnosis. There are some subtle differences in, in how they present, but we treat uh, both mutations or both variants the same in terms of the monitoring and treatment that we would recommend for people. Yeah. Is TS1 um, better than TS2? TS2 is worse and pain and things you're going through inside your body? I think that we, we, we can't really say that for, for each of them. They, they have, as I say, some subtle differences, but essentially they cause the same condition and, this, and everyone has an individual experience. For example, someone who has TSC2 and another person who has TSC2 may have very different conditions. So one person may be affected in multiple organs and have seizures and, and other issues, whereas the other person with the same mutation may only have some skin issues um, so we can't predict based on the gene what the person's going to experience. It's very variable between different people. And is that because there's not a lot of people with this disease that we can't? No, so with genetic conditions, we, we often, uh, with some genetic conditions, there is a strong association with the particular gene and the, thing, the uh, disease that the person experiences. And some don't have a, a close correlation. So the gene can cause different um, experiences and TSC is like that. You can get very different experiences even with the same gene affected. So it doesn't predict strongly. And even people in the same family, many of you may know that you have generations where the experience is quite different between either siblings or a parent and a child. So the gene doesn't directly predict the what the person is going to experience. Yeah. How often would an adult need to have CT scan to monitor them? So I'll, I'll come to the current guidelines a little bit later in the talk, but typically it's in between one and three years, but we'll, we'll come to that again a little bit later. We'll come back to the treatment of angiomyelopomas and, and the tests that we do for them, but I just wanted to move on to cysts. And cysts are essentially little areas of bubbles of fluid in our body. We can get them in lots of different places, but in the kidney you can get different types of cysts. So they look, when we look at a scan, like a little black area on a CT scan, for example, because it's just a little bubble of fluid. The cysts can affect different parts of the kidney, so they might be tiny little cysts that we call microcysts. They might affect an area called the, the cortex or the outside of the kidney. Or sometimes the cyst can be very large um, and be something that we call polycystic um, kidneys. And that's because the TSC gene on your genome, in the, in the book of your genes, lies quite close to another gene called PKD1. And that, that PKD1 gene uh, causes a condition called polycystic kidney disease. Some of you may have heard of this. This is a disease that is much more common than tubular sclerosis in the, in the population. But some people have um, both of those genes because they're very close to each other, have an effect where they, both of them are affected. And in this case, people get very a lot of cysts in their kidneys and very large cysts, and these cysts can grow and cause problems for them. So um, that's one thing that some of you in the may room may experience, but it's a separate condition because the genes are very close. They can sometimes occur in the same person. And why do cysts, why do we care about cysts? Well, most of the time, cysts don't cause problems. They're just little spots we see on the kidneys and you don't tend to have any issues from them. 
but they might contribute to developing chronic kidney disease. And chronic kidney disease is where the kidney, the function that it does to clear toxins from your body and balance fluid may be affected, and so you might start to get issues with how your kidneys are functioning. So cysts might contribute to that. Sometimes if they get very large, they might cause pain or discomfort. Um, but the treatment for cysts, unlike angiomyelipomas, which we'll get to later, is mainly to treat your general kidney health and blood pressure rather than target the cysts specifically. And the final thing to talk about is um, renal cell carcinoma or kidney cancer. Now, people with tubular sclerosis are affected more commonly with kidney cancer than people in the general population but it's not a very common diagnosis. So about three in 100 or three percent of people or three in 100 people may be affected by kidney cancer in their lifetime with tubular sclerosis. Um, it's something that we need to be mindful of and, and look out for and um, treat differently if it, from an angiomyelipoma. So it's important to be aware of that increased risk, but still the vast majority of people with tubular sclerosis won't get kidney cancer. So the treatment of kidney cancer is different. I'll just touch on this briefly. Most of the time it's an operation to remove the cancer so that it doesn't spread. And they're important because sometimes on the scans it can be difficult to tell the difference between an AML and a kidney cancer. And sometimes we need to do things like a biopsy, which is where we take some of the tissue and look at it under a microscope to see if there is a difference between the AML and the kidney cancer. I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail, but there was a very interest for those who are interested in the more technical aspects of it. There was a very interesting paper that was published in one of the American um, kidney journals recently with some new theories about how all these kidney problems may be related, the cysts and um, the AMLs and whether they represent um, that second mutation that we talked about before occurring at different pathways as a cell grows. And so that's just an interesting, different way of looking at the development of kidney problems in tubular sclerosis for those of you that are more technically minded that I won't go into in a lot of detail today. How do we monitor for these problems in, in your kidneys? Now, your kidneys are obviously inside your body, very difficult to feel, and we need a way of seeing inside. So we do various types of scans. And we have different scans that are available to us to look at the kidneys. They all have their pros and their cons, benefits and things that um, uh, make them more challenging. So ultrasound, many of you are familiar with ultrasounds from perhaps being pregnant in the past or having um, other problems looked at in your body. This is where we use sound waves to have a look at the structure of the kidney and how they bounce off the kidney gives us a picture of them. Now ultrasound is a very easy and quick treatment. It's very cheap and you can get them anywhere. There's lots of ultrasound places around. It's a very safe procedure because just bouncing sound waves off your kidneys has no negative effects on that. And so it's a very convenient way of monitoring kidneys. But it's not a perfect um, scan. It might not detect very small things that we see. And it's difficult to monitor how much things are growing and to measure them on an ultrasound because it can very much depend on the person who's doing it at the time. And it can be hard to get an ac accurate change over time in ultrasound. So for some people, it's a good screening test, but it makes it difficult to monitor things accurately on an ultrasound over time. So someone mentioned a CT scan before. A CT scan uses x-rays to look inside the body. Um, this is another way we can look at the kidneys and monitor these over time. It's also very easy to get a CT scan. There are lots of CT scanners out there. And it's a fairly brief thing, so people can lie, don't have to lie still for very long to have a CT scan. It gives us good pictures of the kidneys um, and it helps us measure them very accurately. But it does have some downsides. With x-rays, there is a small amount of radiation associated with them. And if there's a lot of radiation over time, that can uh, have its own risks associated with it. And also sometimes um, people need to have contrast agents injected. And some people have reactions to those or they can have um, effects on the body. So the, the final way that we have of looking at the kidneys is an MRI scan. And some of you may have had one of these to look at your kidneys. It's very, they're very accurate. They use magnets to give us pictures of the in, inside of the kidneys. So there's no radiation associated with an MRI, which is good. And it gives us very good pictures of fat inside the kidney. And that's very helpful for making diagnoses. 
but they can be more difficult to access. Um, you have to lie still for a long time for an MRI, so for people who find that challenging, it can be difficult, and some people might require some sedation or even to be put to sleep for a period to get an MRI. And at the moment, they aren't paid for for looking at kidneys by the um, Medicare scheme. So there is an out-of-pocket expense of around $500 for an MRI to have um, uh, that particular scan. Now, we've been doing some work recently with uh, TSA and, and Rare Voices Australia to try and put in some applications for this, and that's been progressing really well. And I think we've had some indications that we're likely to make some progress on that but the timeframes are unclear at the moment. So hopefully it'll be paid for, for for people with TSC in the future, but that's something we're working on so that people can access this scan. Um, one of the other issues is it's not necessarily compatible if you have an implant. Some people may have um, implants for management of their seizures, for example, and it might be difficult to um, get an MRI if there's an interaction there. So once we've done a scan and diagnosed an, uh, a kidney problem, what are the treatments that are available? And some of you may have experienced some of these treatments, um, or it may be something we have to discuss in the future. So the main reason to treat these um, AMLs in particular is to stop them from bleeding. And so one option uh, is to perform surgery. And the gentleman up the back here uh, may have mentioned he had some surgery or some experience of it in the past. And this is where the, the tumour is cut out of the kidney. This used to be a very common way of treating AMLs for people with tubular sclerosis, but we've moved very much away from this. And this is because whenever you cut out something from the body, it, you inevitably take some of the good tissue around it as well. And you can imagine if you just have to do that once, that's not a big issue, but if you've got multiple AMLs in your kidneys and you have to have multiple operations, the kidney tissue gets removed and you no longer have functional kidney tissue to keep you healthy. So if we can avoid cutting out the lesions, that's a positive thing. So sometimes we have to, but ideally we want to use a different treatment where we're not going to have to cut out the healthy bit of tissue over time. This might be appropriate for some people who have just one lesion. Um, every circumstance is, is different, but sometimes they can take the kidney, cut the lesion out and put some of the kidney back in and that may be an option for some people. But hopefully we can avoid needing to do surgery in most people by using one of the next two treatments. Another treatment is something called embolization. And this is where, um, this is how you would treat uh, a bleeding lesion in the kidney if it suddenly bled and we need to treat it in an urgent situation. And sometimes we use this to treat lesions that are, are large and to stop, prevent them from bleeding. And what this involves is going in like an angiogram that someone might have from their heart, in through the groin, and feeding a wire up to the blood vessels that supply the tumour, and then either injecting something or putting a coil in there that stops the blood supply and essentially blocks off the blood supply to, to that region so that it stops growing and it either stops the bleeding or doesn't have a risk of bleeding in the future. This is called embolization. And, but you can only really use it to target one lesion or maybe a couple of lesions at the same time. And therefore, for people who have lots of AMLs in their kidney, it's not a very effective uh, treatment. And it also has some risks associated with it, with um, sorry, damaging kidney tissue that's healthy around there. And sometimes it can cause symptoms for people having um, an area of tissue that's blocked off, and we need to treat that and prevent the, the pain associated with that if that's something you're going through. So this is a treatment that is definitely useful in someone who's having a bleed, and sometimes useful in specific uh, circumstances. But what we try and do now is prevent the need for embolization and prevent the need for surgery by getting more at the root of the problem rather than dealing with it once it develops. And we can do that now because we have medications. We, in the beginning of the talk, I talked about um, the fact that tubular sclerosis affects this pathway with uh, mTORC in it. We conveniently have a drug or a number of drugs that can target this pathway and block the mTOR pathway, essentially replacing what the, the TSC gene would normally do and therefore fixing the sort of root of the problem rather than responding to where, when the, the tumour has grown. Now, the names of the two drugs that are available in Australia are Sirolimus and Everolimus, uh, and these medications work essentially in the same way to block that particular pathway and stop those cells from growing. 
Now, there's been a, a big trial done uh, in um, looking at people who have AMLs and tubular sclerosis and how effective everolimus is in particular at um, stopping the growth of these tumours. <coughs> This was what we call a, a, a blind placebo control trial. So the people who went into it, half of the people got the treatment and half of the people got no, um, didn't get the treatment. And then we compared what happened to, um, so it wasn't quite half, two thirds of people got the treatment and one third didn't get the treatment. And then we compared the difference of what happened to them. We didn't, but um, other authors did. And to be in this trial, people needed to have at least one AML greater than three centimetres and be an adult with tubular sclerosis. And they were assessing the effectiveness of this by looking at how many of the tumours shrunk by at least 50% on the medication. They found that 42% of people um, who got the medication met that. They had at least a 50% shrinkage in their tumour and that 80% of people who got the medication had at least some shrinkage of their tumour um, versus only 3% in the people who didn't get the medication. So this trial showed effectively that the medication helped to shrink the tumours over time and associated with that um, reduced the risk of, of bleeding. I'm not expecting everyone to read this uh, slide, but it is to say that like many medications, everolimus and serolimus do have a lot of side effects associated with them. So if it is a treatment that um, your doctor recommends for you, they'll talk to you about what those side effects are, how we manage them, and what monitoring we need to do in order to um, keep you healthy whilst you're on this medication. So sometimes people need adjustments in their dosage or use of other medications to manage side effects, but it's something that we need to talk through if this is the right treatment option for you. They did a follow-up study of the initial trial and they showed that even more people got an effect after staying on it for a long time. So that's just to mention that it's, uh, we're getting more and more um, evidence of how that uh, can be effective over many years for people to treat their kidney lesions. So this brings us to what the current guidelines are. And in tubular sclerosis, there's some fantastic guidelines that have been developed by experts who have come together from around the world to talk about the best way of diagnosing tubular sclerosis, of um, looking for the complications of it and for helping to manage those. And so this comes back to your question initially of how often we should be doing scans. And the current guidelines recommend an MRI as the best available scan based on those pros and cons we talked about before. And that um, people should be getting um, a scan one to three years throughout their life. And this is where we start. So everyone who is diagnosed with tubular sclerosis would get a baseline MRI um, or equivalent scan depending on what, what is available for them and then follow that up. Some people who may have very small lesions may not need scans as frequently, and some people with complications may need them more frequently. But on average, we look at every one to three years to monitor for those complications. It's also recommended that for people living with tubular sclerosis, we check um, your kidney function once a year, and we do that with a blood test and a urine test and to check your blood pressure. And the, the third recommendation here is that if there is a bleed, embolization should be the first treatment. So we should try and block off that bleed uh, rather than performing a surgery to try and preserve the kidney as much as we can. A nephrectomy is a term for removing one of the kidneys and we should try and avoid that as much as possible to preserve the good kidney function. Um, and the recommendation from the international guidelines is for people who have lesions larger than three centimetres that are growing over time, our first treatment should be with medication with an mTOR inhibitor in order to stop the growth. And fortunately in Australia, we have access to mTOR inhibitors through the PBS, which means that the, the cost of the medication is, is uh, covered by the government and you would just pay the normal cost that you'd pay for any other medication and can access this freely, which is fantastic. And the final point there is that embolization may be effective for some people who don't respond to mTOR inhibitors or who have um, complex lesions where that might be benefit. And of course, in some cases, surgery may be indicated, but that's a very specific individual thing. Helen? Uh, what's the dose of steroids and for how long? The dose of steroids, there's no um, uh, absolute. There have been a few small studies. So 
this, Helen's asking specifically around when we do an embolization, so when we block off the blood supply to an area of the kidney, that can cause some pain from the inflammation. And there have been some studies that show we can reduce that pain and any fever associated with it by giving steroids, the type of medication you might have for an asthma attack or an episode of arthritis. Um, now, the dose that I typically use is 50 milligrams uh, once a day for a, a period of a week. Um, there are some small case series that have used higher doses with a um, methylprednisolone of um, higher dose at, at the time, but I've found that 50 milligrams daily has been an effective dose uh, in preventing a post-embolization post syndrome. Sure, so the question, because I'm not sure it'll be captured on the recording, is um, do we use mTOR inhibitors for multiple reasons, for example, brain and kidney at the same time? Um, and is there a difference between sirolimus and everolimus? So to answer your questions, whatever the initial indi indication that we start an mTOR inhibitor, it will have the effects on the other organs as well. So some people, um, there's more and more research coming out about the role of mTOR inhibitors, for example, in the brain lesions. Helen will talk about the lung uh, indications a bit later. And if someone is started on it for that reason, it's also going to have a beneficial effect from the kidney. So there's normally um, a particular reason we start, whether that's because of large kidney lesions or um, because of uh, brain lesions, for example, but it will have a benefit for both or for all organs associated with it at the time. And your second question about whether there's a difference between everolimus and sirolimus, there haven't been any studies that have directly compared them, so it's very hard to say, because that's the best evidence we have where we do a trial and look at them both. Um, they both work in the same way on the same pathway, um, and so we would expect them to work similarly. For kidneys in particular, because the trials have been done with everolimus, that's the medication we use, we have the best quality of evidence. That being said, if someone doesn't tolerate everolimus or they're on sirolimus because of a lung indication, I would expect that to work as well based on the, um, the mechanism, but we just don't have a study that has proved that yet. Yeah. So they're the guidelines. So that's sort of the main bulk of talking about how tuberous sclerosis affects people's kidneys and the treatments we have and, and the things we need to do to monitor it. I'm just going to move on to talk a little bit about general kidney health for a moment. I'm not sure how I'm going for time. Ten minutes. Um, just separate from from everol, sorry, separate from tubular sclerosis. How do we keep our kidneys healthy? And if you had have had to have surgery on your kidneys or an embolization, it's even more important to keep your kidneys healthy because you don't have as much kidney tissue there that's going to um, help you to stay well over time. So coming back to what your kidneys do, I mentioned this briefly before, they work in um, balancing our body, essentially. So they filter our blood and produce urine, and part of that process, they balance water in our bodies. So um, based on how much water we drink, our kidneys adjust and excrete that through urine, and that can help us to balance the water, and also the salts in our body, things like sodium and chloride and all of the other salts are closely regulated by your kidneys. So that's an important function that they do. They get rid of the waste products that are produced by our body. So as part of our normal metabolism, our cells produce waste products and our kidneys help to clear those from the body, which keeps us healthy. They also work in other systems of the body. Your kidneys help to control blood pressure. And so when your kidneys aren't functioning properly, that can affect your blood pressure and can be one of the factors that leads to high blood pressure in some people. And they're also involved in some of the hormones in our body, like vitamin D, which is important for keeping our bones healthy. Kidneys help to activate that and, and help it work in the rest of the body. So there's lots of different functions that our kidneys do. The eight golden rules of kidney health are produced by um, a group called World Kidney Day, which happens once a year. And each year they choose a different theme for highlighting kidney health. And in the past, they've looked at trying to define eight simple rules that help people to keep their kidneys healthy. So fortunately, most of the things that keep your kidneys healthy are also the same things that keep your heart healthy and overall your, your body in good condition. So keeping fit and active is beneficial for, for helping your kidney health. Watching blood pressure. We know that in Australia and globally, diabetes is one of the major causes of kidney impairment. And so diagnosing diabetes and treating diabetes is one of the best things we can do to protect kidney function. 
We mentioned that kidneys affect blood pressure, but high blood pressure also can cause damage to kidneys. So monitoring and treating blood pressure is really important for kidney health. Part of all of those things is eating healthy and keeping your weight at a healthy, um, in a healthy range, and that helps your kidney health and overall heart health. Making sure you have enough fluid to drink and avoid getting dehydrated uh, helps to keep your kidneys healthy. And really importantly, uh, to avoid cigarette smoking, which damages the blood vessels in your kidneys and is also a risk factor for some of the things that we talked about before, like kidney cancer. Um, smoking increases your risk of kidney cancer. And we already know that people with tubular sclerosis are at higher risk than, than the general population. There's some medications over the counter that we shouldn't take too much of. And the, and the main one there is anti-inflammatory medications. Um, occasional use is safe for your kidneys, but taking them on a regular or more than a, a standard dose can affect them. And the final thing is to get your kidneys checked if you have a risk factor. Uh, and that involves often a urine test, blood test, or a blood pressure. And everyone with tubular sclerosis, as we say, has a risk factor, and so should have a, at least an annual check of their kidney health over time. So there's some generic things uh, that we can do to keep our kidneys healthy for all of us. On the dietary front, as I mentioned before, fortunately all the things that are good for your, kid are good for your heart are also good for your kidneys. So um, dietary advice can get complicated. My simple advice is the closer we can eat things to the original form they were grown in, generally the healthier they are. And so avoiding things that are overly processed, that have excess sugar added to them, that have extra salt added to them, uh, is general advice that helps keep our heart and kidneys healthy. I'm not sure whether I have very much time to talk about the other ways that uh, tubular sclerosis affects um, people. I can have a brief outline of this and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. We mentioned before that tumours can grow in multiple organs and that, that can have different manifestations for, for, for people living with tubular sclerosis. One of the, the key ways that we're understanding more and more over time is the subtle ways in which um, tubular sclerosis affects people neurologically. And many of you will have heard of the, the term tubular sclerosis associated neuropsychiatric disorders or TAND. And this means that many people with tubular sclerosis have a spectrum of ways in which this affects them. And it can range from um, a significant intellectual impairment um, to things such as anxiety and depression that may be more common in people with tubular sclerosis, and um, conditions such as autism, which can occur very commonly in people with tubular sclerosis. And we're learning more and more about the diverse ways that um, this can affect people, and different treatments uh, and ways that we can support people who are affected in that way. There is, uh, I'm just going to mention another study that's been uh, done over the last few years, which is called the TOSCA study. And this is a very useful way of understanding how tubular sclerosis affects people. Uh, a group internationally got together and started a registry of people, which means they collected information on lots of people living with tubular sclerosis to try and understand how the condition affects people in different ways. And you can go and read reports and studies uh, from this. But their baseline data, they asked essentially people questions on you know, what conditions they had. And it shows that as well as the common things we've talked about already with uh, brain, kidneys, heart, lungs, people can also grow tumours in their liver. It can affect um, the menstrual cycle of, of women. There can be um, lesions that grow in the bone and in other tissues such as the thyroid or the pancreas. And everyone is unique in this situation and you may be affected in a way which uh, is less common. So by joining together with lots of international groups and learning from people living with tubular sclerosis, we can understand more and more about the rarer things that happen in this condition and the best way that we can treat them. So that's really all I wanted to say today about some background for tubular sclerosis, how it affects uh, your kidneys, the treatments that are available, what we need to do to monitor them, and how to keep your kidneys healthy. And I'd be happy to have more of a conversation about any of those things if anyone has any more questions. Does tubular sclerosis bring the high blood pressure down to low blood pressure? Does it bring the high blood pressure down? No, not in itself. People with tubular sclerosis are more likely to have high blood pressure, particularly if their kidneys are affected by cysts or AMLs or they've had to have a procedure. And mTOR inhibitors are also associated with increasing blood pressure. 
So it's more likely that people with tuberous sclerosis may have high blood pressure and may need to have treatments for that, like the general population. The only way that it really brings your blood pressure down is what if there was an acute problem like a bleed, but most of the time it puts blood pressure up over time. Hi, Matt. Yeah, well, Australia. Hi, okay. Um, when they get an MRI, unless you stipulate, will they check out the liver and the spleen? So, yes, typically uh, scans of the abdomen, they will also review other organs in the abdomen. Um, so typically you will see if there is an issue in the liver or the pancreas or the spleen. They're the other organs that sit close to the kidneys and the abdomen. Uh, and that's often how things such as a pancreatic tumour. So um, interestingly, in the study that I mentioned before, um, this study of, of several hundred people, they saw only five pancreatic tumours. In the patients that I look after, I have at least five patients who have pancreatic tumours. So we find it's more common the, the more we look for it, and it's often incidentally found in scans like that. They won't see organs that are further away, although sometimes, um, Helen may come back to this, we may catch the bottom of the lungs in a, a tummy scan, and that way we might see some information about the lungs that tell us something, but we might have to go on and do a dedicated scan there and separate. But organs nearby the kidneys will, will be seen, yeah. Yes. Why are we more than Hi, Why can't we, for specific patients, look at the lung simultaneously? So, uh, Helen, we've got. And all the brain. Yeah. So, we often do look at the brain because we, we do MRI for both of those. Um, and so, we try and coordinate those scans if we can, particularly if someone's going to need an anesthetic or sedation. Obviously, we'd like to avoid having multiple times for that. Um, MRI, Helen can expand on this later, but is not the ideal treatment for uh, ideal scan for looking at the lungs, and it doesn't give us very accurate diagnosis. So, um, a CT scan is more accurate at looking at that. But I'll... the problem with an MRI is that the time to apply the scan takes so long that uh, you have to breathe. So there's movement artifact because um, we can't stop people breathing. You can make them lie still. Uh, but even with an anaesthetic, they still have to breathe. Yeah. So we'll always need for the lung with a slightly. The heart, you can do an MRI because you can gauge it to the beat of the heart, because the heart is regular. Um, but because the uh, lungs, it's not regular. It's very hard to. Uh, um, so the CT scan is much better. Mm -hmm. But yeah, certainly we will try and combine an MRI of the brain and kidneys when we can to reduce the number of times people need to come to a hospital and things like that. It does make the scan longer, which means someone needs to lie still for, for a longer period of time, which can be a challenge as well for some people. Is there any new medications coming out to help with tuberous sclerosis? So there are different trials that are going on looking at other medications. So... Um, there are some medications that already exist and are used for other reasons, like a drug called metformin, which is used for diabetes. And there are trials looking at whether that's effective, um, whether they'll show any benefit or not. We have to wait for that evidence to come out. Um, so there are always new things being developed. There is nothing that has shown up in a recent trial that's finished that's going to change the landscape at the moment, but there's always things that are being looked at and investigated. Some of those show that there aren't any benefit and, and that we don't go on. Um, we're fortunate in tuberous sclerosis to have a very specific drug that specifically relates to um, the lesion and therefore it, it can target. We need to learn more about that medication as well. But there will always be ways in which we're exploring. And there are new technologies now that we're developing where we can actually edit genes um, inside the body. So for some conditions, we're starting to do experiments where we can edit genes. And that may be an area of uh, future research for tuberous sclerosis where we can actually edit the gene already inside the body, but we don't have that information yet. Why the three centimetre rule? So the three centimetre rule, we know that the risk of bleeding is associated with the lesions growing larger over time. It's difficult to say exactly when that risk, it's a spectrum and there is a low risk and at some point will become high. The three centimetre rule is based around the trial that was done. That's the, where the evidence comes from. They're the population and that's how we included people. 
The risk of bleeding at four centimeters is still likely very low based on other information. So there may be some situations if a lesion isn't growing very quickly, we may not start until the lesion's a bit higher. Um, so it's hard to pick an exact point, but we know the bigger lesions get, um, the higher the risk of bleeding. And the three centimeters specifically is based on the EXIST2 trial. That's the inclusion criteria and the one that we know was, had evidence for it. Yeah. But like in all medicine, it's taking the evidence and then using it for the individual because everyone will be a little bit different and that trial might not relate directly to, to you or your loved one. In the MRI scans, they're not looking specifically, oh, this lesion is that big and 80% of it is that? So we, we do get some information about the types of cells that are making them up, um, that we don't calculate that, but it but does become re relevant if there is very little fat in a lesion. One of the most useful things about diagnosing AMLs is that they contain fat. And if they contain fat, we're pretty confident that they're an AML. There are some AMLs that are what we call fat poor, and that's when there's very little or no fat that we can see on the scan. And in that situation, it's difficult to tell the difference between an AML and a cancer. And they're the ones that make a little bit of a challenge for us in saying, if it's an AML and it's only two centimeters, we don't need to do anything about it. But if it's a cancer and it's a two centimeters, we might need to. So the scans do give us some information about the tissue that makes them up and helps guide decision. But typically we don't calculate the percentage unless they're very small. I was just wondering whether the more fatty or um, less likely the main thing that helps predict on uh, the risk of bleeding on the scan, apart from the size and rate of growth, is the uh, characteristics of the blood vessels. So we may sometimes see what we call aneurysms, which is where a blood vessel balloons out quite wide. And if there are aneurysms that we see on the scan, we know that's a higher risk of bleeding, and that may prompt us to do something different. Um, so looking at the blood vessels specifically on the scan, the aneurysms can help us predict the risk of bleeding. On the report? It depends. So to look at aneurysms, you need to um, use contrast, so where we inject something, um, and it can depend on, so they, they may or they, uh, it depends on the type of scan and the technical aspects that are included in that specific scan. Should you feel disadvantaged if you're in a, you know, a, a lesion that's 2.9? Should you feel, feel disadvantaged about not qualifying for the medication? No, so so we there is in accessing the medication there is no specific measurement. So um, you you the uh, criteria for accessing the medication is having lesions that um, that need the treatment essentially. So you can start it if it's two point nine. I would say that you don't need the medication at that point, and so we always balance the side effects of any medication to the benefits of it. And if your lesion stays at 2.9 centimeters into the future, you might get away with not needing to have a medication to manage that, and that's a positive thing. So if you need the medication, it's available, but... Yes, yeah, so, so each organ can be also considered separately, and if you need it for another indication, we can start it. Um, there are also, you sort of, I think, alluded to there some of the, the skin manifestations. We can use a topical version of the mTOR inhibitors as well, which we can put directly onto the skin, and that has less side effects, but has sometimes the benefits of, of helping with those skin lesions. So if you need the medication, it's available, um, but we don't want to start it in people who, are, who aren't going to get a benefit from it and just give people side effects without a benefit. Okay. Okay, so if there aren't any other questions, um, thank you, Matt. I think it's a very small token of thanks for being with us today thank and for that really great presentation.